Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment. And we're taking a look at the 23rd Vice President of the United States, Adlai Ewing Stevenson. So we got some really cool things to tell you about Adlai Ewing Stevenson, but first, before we get into Adlai Stevenson, what I need you to do is hit subscribe down below. Leave us a like and a thumbs up. Leave all those comments and questions. We love the comments and questions. And of course, hit that little notification bell so you can be notified when we do release a new video, which is every single week. If Henry was here, he would let you know. So here we go. Sit back because we are about to get into the 23rd Vice President of the United States, Adlai E. Stevenson. And this is Dead History. Hey guys, TJ back with you. And yeah, this guy right here, that's Adlai Ewing Stevenson, the 23rd Vice President of the United States, our next Vice Presidential Series installment here at Dead History. Some cool things to tell you about Stevenson. Of course, he was the Vice President under Grover Cleveland in Grover Cleveland's second term. Yeah, so pretty cool stuff. Of course, Grover Cleveland, New Jersey native, so that's always cool. Adley Stevenson, another pretty cool thing about him is he had a family steeped in some historical, political ties, all that kind of thing. Because he was the grandfather, his grandson, Adlai E. Stevenson, he ran for president against FDR. Or no, was it FDR? I don't believe, I think it was actually Dwight Eisenhower who he actually ran for president against. But he ran for president years later, 50, 60 years later, after his grandfather was in politics. So some pretty cool stuff. And then, I believe it's actually his great-grandson is also involved in politics. Not to the extent of grandfather and grandson, but still involved in politics, ran for governor, all that sort of thing. So family steeped in politics and historical things. So some pretty cool stuff. Uh, what else do I have to tell you? Born in Kentucky, lived in Illinois most of his life, buried out in Illinois, so pretty cool stuff. Midwest guy. So we're going to get into it right now. The 23rd Vice President of the United States. You did the likes, you did the subscribes, you did the comments, did the questions, did it all. Notification bell. If Henry was here, he'd tell you, go get the popcorn. Go get the potato chips. Go get the soda. Go get the gummy bears. Go get it all. And, you know, who knows? I mean, if you're in the Northeast, this weekend we might be getting some sort of big snowstorm. So you might be snowed in. Get the snacks and watch Dead History because here we go. Our next Vice Presidential Series installment, 23rd Vice President, Adlai Ewing Stevenson. Sit back, relax, and enjoy. Hey guys, how's it going? TJ here with Dead History, and welcome to our next Vice Presidential Series installment as we're taking a look at the 23rd Vice President of the United States, Adlai Ewing Stevenson. Uh, I am flying solo, of course, for the audio portion of this Vice Presidential Series installment. Henry is not with me. So, a couple of things that I uh, do want to go over. Uh, I do want to touch on a couple things so everybody knows what is coming up over the next couple of weeks here on the channel. So, of course, as you watch this, uh, you're watching this video on uh, Thursday, uh, January 27th. And then, of course, part two will be tomorrow, Friday, January 28th. Uh, and then next week, which is actually Thursday, February 3rd and Friday, February 4th. Hard to believe we're already uh, into February of this year. Uh Next week would normally be our Vice Presidential Series installment, of course. However, we are taking the week off uh, because I have some very special uh, bonus footage coming up 
for next week's episode, technically, uh, who is Garrett Hobart. He's the next vice president after uh, this week. So uh, he's a New Jersey guy, so I have some cool things to show you and bring you. But um, it's going to take me a little longer than usual to uh, to be able to actually uh, record that bonus footage and get it all, all done. So next week, uh, I'm not sure if we're going to be doing a live stream, possibly, or uh, releasing just kind of a fun video uh, for the week. But uh, we are taking just a one-week break in our vice presidential series, and then that will return the following week, which will technically, of course, be February 10th, that Thursday, and then Friday, February 11th. So... Just so everyone knows that and keeps that in mind, that is what's happening and that is what the game plan is. Um, what else? Is there anything else that I need to let you guys know of? Let me think here. I think that's it, actually. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that, of course. Uh, but I don't think there's anything else that I need to announce or anything, at least uh, right now at, that, at this juncture. So, um, So here we go. Here we, uh, let's dive right in to our next vice presidential series installment. The 23rd vice president of the United States, Adlai Ewing Stevenson. Here we go. Has Mr. Cleveland yet consulted you to that extent? Vice President Stevenson was once asked. Not yet, he replied. But there are still a few weeks of my term remaining. In February of 1900, the Chicago American ran a photograph of former Vice President Adlai Stevenson holding his new grandson, Adlai Ewing Stevenson II. That year, the grandfather was again nominated to run for Vice President on the Democratic ticket. A half century later, the grandson would run twice as the Democratic nominee for president and gain even greater national and international prominence. Yet, it was the grandfather who came closest to becoming president of the United States when President Grover Cleveland underwent critical surgery. Youth. The Stevenson family were Presbyterians from Northern Ireland who migrated first to Pennsylvania and then to North Carolina and Kentucky. Adlai E. Stevenson, son of John Turner Stevenson and Eliza Ewing Stevenson, was born on the family farm in Christian County, Kentucky, on October 23rd of 1835. He attended the common school in Blue Water, Kentucky, presided over by a dreaded schoolmaster, Mr. Caskey. Years later, when as vice presidential candidate Stevenson was about to speak at a barbecue in Kentucky, the elderly schoolmaster approached the platform and inquired, Adlai, I came 20 miles to hear you speak. Don't you remember me? Stevenson instantly replied, Yes, Mr. Kasky, I still have a few marks left to remember you by. In 1852, when Adlai was 16, Frost killed the family's tobacco crop. His father set free their few slaves and moved to Bloomington, Illinois, where he operated a sawmill. Adlai worked in the mill and taught school, earning money for college. He attended the Presbyterian-run Center College in Danville, Kentucky, headed by the Reverend Lewis Warner Green. Adlai fell in love with Green's daughter, Letitia, but family problems delayed their marriage for nine years. His father's death prompted Adlai to return to Bloomington to run the sawmill, 
Then, when the Reverend Green died, Letitia and her mother moved near Bloomington. Mrs. Green considered the Stevenson socially inferior. Stevenson's, I'm sorry, socially inferior and did not favor a marriage between the young people, even though Adlai had studied law and had been admitted to the bar in 1858. Not until 1866 did Adlai and Letitia finally marry. They had three daughters and a son, Louis, who became father to the later presidential candidate. A Democrat in Republican territory. As a young lawyer, Stevenson encountered such celebrated Illinois attorneys as Stephen A. Douglas and Abraham Lincoln, campaigning for Douglas in his 1858 Senate race against Lincoln. Stevenson also made speeches against the Know Nothing Movement, a nativist group opposed to immigrants and Catholics. That stand helped cement his support in Illinois, Illinois' large German and Irish communities. In a predominantly Republican area, the Democratic Stevenson won friends through his storytelling and his warm and engaging personality. In 1860, at the age of 25, he was appointed Master in Chancery and aide in a court of equity, his first public office, which he held during the Civil War. In 1864, Adlai Stevenson was elected district attorney, and at the end of his term in 1868, he entered the law practice with his cousin, James S. Ewing. Stevenson and Ewing became one of the state's most prominent law firms. In 1874, when Stevenson ran for the House of Representatives as a Democrat, Local Republican newspapers painted him as a vile secessionist, but the continuing hardships from the economic panic of 1873 caused voters to sweep him into the office with the first Democratic congressional majority since the Civil War. In the presidential election year of 1876, however, the Republican ticket headed by Rutherford B. Hayes, carried his district, and Stevenson was narrowly defeated for re-election, taking 49.6% of the vote. Then, in 1878, he ran on both the Democratic and Greenback tickets and won. Returning to a house from which one-third of his earlier colleagues had either voluntarily retired or been retired by the voters, gave Stevenson a sense of the swiftly changing tides of politics. In 1880, again a presidential election year, he once more lost narrowly, and he was defeated in his final race for Congress in 1882. The Headsman of the Post Office Stevenson served as a delegate to the Democratic Convention of 1884 that nominated Grover Cleveland for president. Cleveland's reform record as governor of New York helped win over Republican reformers, the Mugwumps, who enabled him to defeat the popular but scandal-ridden Republican candidate, James G. Blaine. When Cleveland took office as president, the Mugwumps expected him to carry out the goals of civil service reform rather than return to the spoilsmanship of Jacksonian democracy. They felt reassured at first when Cleveland appointed an able Republican as postmaster of New York, of New York City. But job-hungry Democrats besieged the administration for patronage and the president had to respond to the angry rumblings from his party on Capitol Hill. Particularly at stake 
were the 55,000 fourth class postmasters. Although paying just a thousand dollars a year, these offices were critically important to local political operations. In small towns, the postmaster knew everyone as well as the mail they received and the newspapers and magazines they read. This knowledge placed the postmasters in an excellent position to keep the National Party organization informed on public opinion. The local postmasters would also distribute, distribute party literature in bulk more cheaply than if it were individually addressed. Former Democratic nominee Samuel J. Tilden, a master political organizer, reminded the Cleveland administration that these rural post offices essentially served as their party's local headquarters. To leave them in the hands of Republicans would be infidel infidelity to the principles and causes of the administration. When first assistant postmaster general Malcolm Hay, a civil service reformer, resigned due to ill health after only three months in office, Cleveland appointed the more partisan Adlai Stevenson to succeed him, giving free reign to remove Republican office holders. Stevenson thoroughly enjoyed swinging the axe. One Republican journalist described Stevenson as an official axe man who beheaded Republican office holders with the precision and dispatch of the French guillotine in the days of the revolution. Dubbed the headsman for replacing some 40,000 Republicans with deserving Democrats, he once decapitated 65 Republican postmasters in two minutes. Republicans protested, but recognized that they had swung the same acts, and even the mugwumps realized that true civil service reform probably could not be achieved until greater balance was achieved between Democratic and Republican office holders. And obviously, I know it's pronounced guillotine. I said guillotine, but yes, I know it's a French <laughs> guillotine. I'm very well aware. Uh, sorry, I correct myself. So here we go, reading more about him uh, being the headsman of the post office. Grover Cleveland rewarded Adlai Stevenson with a judicial nomination to the Supreme Court of the District of Columbia. But Senate Republicans refused to confirm the man who had discharged so many of their postmasters. When Cleveland was defeated... For re-election in 1888, President Benjamin Harrison appointed James S. Clarkson as first assistant postmaster general, and Clarkson promptly undid Stevenson's handiwork by replacing 32,335 of the fourth-class postmasters. When the Democrats chose Cleveland once again as their standard bearer in 1892, they appeased party regulars by the nomination of the headsman of the post office, Adlai Stevenson, for vice president. As a supporter of using greenbacks and free silver to inflate the currency and alleviate economic distress in the rural districts, Stevenson balanced the ticket headed by Cleveland, the hard money, gold standard supporter that Cleveland was. Just before the election, Grover Cleveland learned that Republicans were planning a lurid expose of Stevenson's soft money record. Cleveland's campaign manager caught Stevenson at a speaking engagement in West Virginia and handed him a letter endorsing sound money. Stevenson signed the letter and released it to the press thus defusing the issue. The winning Cleveland-Stevenson ticket carried Illinois 
although not Stevenson's home district. Civil service reformers held out hope for the second Cleveland administration, but saw Vice President Stevenson as a symbol of the spoils system. He never hesitated to feed names of Democrats to the post office department. Once he called at the Treasury Department to protest against an appointment and was shown a letter he had written endorsing the candidate. Stevenson told the Treasury officials not to pay attention to any of his handwritten endorsements. If he really favored someone, he would tell them personally. So yeah, guys, that pretty much, uh, believe it or not, does it. Uh, as far as Adlai Ewing Stevenson goes, his early life and um, you know political rise. I am going to read you some things uh, because we did kind of touch on already right up to his vice presidency. Um, but here you go, just some uh, overview again. Adlai Ewing Stevenson was born in Christian County, Kentucky on October 23rd of 1835. To John Turner and Eliza Ewing Stevenson, Wesleyans of Scots-Irish descent. The Stevenson family is first recorded as the Stevensons in Roxburghshire, Scotland in the early 18th century. Stevensons being uh, spelled S-T-E-P-H-E-N-S-O-N-S as opposed to the S-T-E-V-E-N-S-O-N. So, uh, the family appears to have been of some wealth as a private chapel in the Archdiocese of St. Andrews bears their name. At some point, probably shortly after the Jacobite Rising of 1715, the family migrated to County Antrim, Ireland, near Belfast. At least one Stevenson was a police officer. William Stevenson, the great-grandfather of Adlai, was a tailor who specialized in millinery. After William's father died in the 1730s, his family moved to Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. William joined when his apprenticeship was completed in 1748. In 1762, the family moved to North Carolina in what is now Iredell County or Iridell County. Including lands given to his children, William Stevenson, Stevenson after the American Revolution, the spelling changed, had amassed 3,400 acres of land by the time of his death. One branch of the family, including Adlai Stevenson's father, then moved to Kentucky in 1813. And then more of his early life, Stevenson was born on the family farm in Christian County. He attended Blue Water School in what is now Herndon, Kentucky. In 1850, when he was 14, Frost killed the family's tobacco crop. Two years later, his father set free their few slaves, and the family moved to Bloomington, Illinois, where his father then operated a sawmill. Stevenson attended Illinois Wesleyan University at Bloomington and ultimately graduated from Center College in Danville, Kentucky. At the latter, he was part of Phi Delta Theta. His father's death prompted Stevenson to return from Kentucky to Illinois to run the sawmill. Stevenson studied law with Bloomington attorney Robert E. Williams. He was admitted to the bar in 1858 and commenced practice in Metamora. As a young lawyer, Stevenson encountered such celebrated Illinois attorneys as Stephen A. Douglas and Abraham Lincoln, and he campaigned for Douglas in his 1858 Senate race against Lincoln. Stevenson's dislike of Lincoln might have been prompted by a contentious meeting between the two at which Lincoln made several witty quips disparaging Stevenson. Stevenson also made speeches against the Know Nothing movement, a nativist group opposed to immigrants and Catholics. That stand helped cement his support in Illinois' large German and Irish communities in a predominantly Republican area that Democratic Stevenson won friends through his storytelling 
and his warm and engaging personality. It's pretty much verbatim. Uh, I'm actually right now reading from Wikipedia, to be uh, completely honest. And it's pretty much verbatim, the research I've already done and the uh, verbatim almost the words that I, I already read. Uh, marriage and political life. Stevenson was appointed master in chancery, his first public office, which he held in the Civil War. In 1866, he married Letitia Green. They had three daughters, Mary, Julia, and Letitia, and a son, Louis Stevenson. Letitia helped establish the Daughters of the American Revolution as a way of healing the divisions between the North and South after the Civil War and succeeded the wife of Benjamin Harrison as the Daughter of American Revolution's second President General. Uh, in 1868, at the end of his term as district attorney, attorney, he entered law practice with his cousin, James Stevenson Ewing, moving with his wife back, in, back to Bloomington, Illinois, and settling in a large house on Franklin Square. Stevenson and Ewing would become one of the state's most prominent law firms, and Ewing would later become the U.S. ambassador to Belgium. Uh... The Democratic Party nominated Stevenson for the United States Congress in 1874. Stevenson was well-liked by Republicans and levied influence in the local Masonic Lodge. Stevenson also received the nomination of the Independent Reform Party, a state party that fought monopolies following the Panic of 1873. Stevenson campaigned against Republican incumbent John McNulta, he attacked McNulty's support for high tariffs and what became known as the Salary Grab Act, where congressmen increased their salaries by 50%. He spoke little of his own positions other than railroad regulation. McNulty attacked back, accusing Stevenson membership in the Knights of the Golden Circle. Thanks to the votes... Siphoned away from the Republican base by the Independent Reform Party, Stevenson won the election with 52% of the vote. Though he did not carry his hometown of Bloomington, he was elevated to the 44th United States, Cong United States Congress, the first under Democratic control since the Civil War. 1876, Stevenson was an unsuccessful candidate for re-election. Uh, we know all that. Um, considered a run in 1884, but a redistrict redistricting made his district safely Republican. Uh, in 1880, uh, uh, again, a presidential election year, he once more lost narrowly, and then he lost again in 1882. I kind of skipped over that, but I touched on that earlier. Uh, in between legislative sessions, Stevenson increased his prominence in Bloomington, Illinois, he rose to become Grand Master of, of his Masonic chapter and founded the Bloomington Daily Bulletin in 1881, a Democratic newspaper that sought to challenge the Republican pantograph. Stevenson directed the People's Bank and co-managed the McLean County Coal Company with his brothers. The company founded Stevensonville, a company town near the mine shafts. Employees were per purportedly fired if they did not support Stevenson in an election year. Interestingly enough. And then, of course, the election of Grover Cleveland in 1884. Stevenson's vacationed. They vacationed at Lake Resorts in Wisconsin during summers. There, Stevenson befriended William Freeman Villas, a growing voice among Midwest Democrats and a friend of Grover Cleveland. Stevenson was a delegate to the 1884 Democratic National Convention, and after briefly supporting a local candidate, he threw his support behind Cleveland. Villas and Stevenson personally informed Cleveland of the nomination. When Cleveland was elected that November, Villas was named Postmaster General, although a different supporter was initially named Assistant Postmaster General, Stevenson received the, received the position after the first choice fell ill. The new position put Stevenson in charge of the largest patronage, syst patronage system in the country. And like his predecessors, Stevenson removed tens of thousands of political opponent, opponents from postal positions and replaced them with Democrats. 
And just before Cleveland left office, he nominated Stevenson for the Supreme Court of the District of Columbia judgeship left vacant by the death of William Matthews Merrick. Republicans controlled the U.S. Senate and refused to act, exacting a measure of revenge on Stevenson for replacing Republican postmasters while also secure in the knowledge that they would be able to confirm a Republican nominee after Benjamin Harrison was inaugurated. A disappointed Stevenson returned to Bloomington, Illinois at the conclusion of Cleveland's term. And that pretty much leads us right up to his vice presidency, uh, which we already kind of touched on a little bit earlier here in part one. Uh, But I'm going to get really deeper into that in part two tomorrow. And we're going to talk, of course, in part two about the vice presidency in more depth. We're going to also talk about the presidential campaigns of 1896 and 1900 and how uh, Stevenson was involved in those. And then, of course, his later years and eventually his death, his legacy and his burial site there in Illinois. So stay tuned for all that in part two tomorrow. So there you go, guys. Uh, A look at our 23rd vice president of the United States Adlai Ewing Stevenson. I hope you enjoyed this part one, taking a look at his early life and his political rise and uh, some of those things uh, that we learned, of course, about Stevenson today. And uh, part two, like I said, that'll be tomorrow and uh, looking at all the rest of his legacy and and such. So uh, thanks, guys, so much for all the support. Thank you for all you guys do. Leave all those comments and questions coming. We love it. And there is no uh, bonus footage here in part uh, one. Um, There will be some in part two with the gravesite, but nothing here in part one. So uh, I thank you so much, and I will see you tomorrow for part two. See you tomorrow. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.